Grog was originally a British admiral. An 11-year-old boy goes 30 feet into a well to save a baby. The composer of I'll Take You Home Again, Kathleen, really meant what he wrote. Can you imagine that? Yes, friends, this is Lindsay McCary, back once more with another batch of stranger-than-fiction facts with which to astound and amaze you. We've dug up some more fascinating peculiarities of this old world of ours, and in just a moment or two, my cohorts and I will be back with you to present them. And yes, sir, we're back. Now, on most of these Can You Imagine That broadcasts, we're going to give you the picturesque origin of some word now in common usage in the English language. The word grog today means any hard liquor or alcoholic beverage. Now, I wonder how many of you know how grog came to possess its present meaning. Well, it goes away back almost 200 years to the year 1740. Let's imagine ourselves back in that year on board an English man of war somewhere on the high seas. Oi, this is a night for work, laddie. You'll be earning your pay and food this night. Wind stirring up the sea like a witch's broth. Hey, look alive there. Old Grog will be coming on deck soon. Oh, look alive. Old Grog? You mean Admiral Vernon. The same, me lad, Admiral Vernon. Him and his Grogram cloak. Grogram cloak? Aye, Grogram cloak. Half wool and half mohair, so they say. He wears it in foul weather. We calls him old Grog. But a better sailor never set foot on oak decks, and a tougher admiral never commanded a ship. Oh, well, let's go below and take on some victuals, lad. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'll move over, matey, and let a man sit down to his supper. Oh, Wait, laddie, in here. I'm hungry. <laughs> and I'm thirsty. Uh, nothing like a panic in a woman room to take the chill out of a man's bones after his walk to wet and stormy deck. Here's the British rum. <coughs> hey, what's this? What's this? <laughs> he don't like it. Who put water in my rum? Foul joke, I calls it, after a man has climbed rope in his sail. Who put water in my rum? Admiral Vernon, old Grog. That's a lie. And if I find the one what done it... Now, it's true, mighty. Old Grog's cutting expensive. And cutting rum does the trick, he thinks. Well, I'll be watered rum. Now, ain't that the thing, watered rum? Taint rum and it ain't water. It's half and half and not fit for either name. I know what we'll call it. Name it after him what thought of it. Grog. That's what it is, Grog. Grog! <laughs> And so the word grog, originally from the French language grogrin, meaning a coarse grain cloth, then into English as grogram, then as a nickname for a famous British admiral, then as his concoction of half rum and half water, now means any alcoholic beverage. Can you imagine that? Now, we're going to take you to Texas, to Eastern Texas to be exact. On February 18, 1928, a group of workmen are busy tearing down the old courthouse to make way for Eastland County's new Capitol building. As the cornerstone is about to be removed, one of the interested visitors, County Judge Edward Pritchard, looks on. Uh, okay, man, she's off. Hey! Hey! Look at here! What's eating you, spy? Seen a healer monster? No! 
But look at this little old horn toad. Well, ain't you ever seen a horn toad before? Yeah, but this one was in that there cornerstone. What is it, boys? What's the matter? Oh, hello, Judge Pritchard. Look what we found. Little old horn toad, dead. Mm, poor little fella. Oh, well, let's see. He's been buried there in that cornerstone for 31 years. That's how old this building is. That's right. Hey, right. hey, you all see what I see? Oh, what's up now, Spike? Can't you see, Judge? That darn thing has opened its eyes. Yes, sir, the horned toad opened its eyes and in a little while began to breathe. Pretty soon, Old Rip, that's what they came to call him, Old Rip became a national institution. He was the living manifestation of the Western Texas legend that a Prinosoma cornutum, horned toad to you, could live a century without food, air, or water. As a matter of fact, Old Rip even visited Calvin Coolidge in the presidential mansion. The whole situation became such a national issue that when another horned toad was sealed in the cornerstone of the new Eastland County Courthouse, a group of humane citizens obtained a court order to have him released. Can you imagine that? But, Lindsay, I can't understand how any living thing could live for 31 years without air or food or water. No? <laughs> well, you know, that's just what a group of scientists couldn't understand either. So some of them began to investigate. After experimenting, this is what two of them said. Dr. William W. Mann, director of the National Zoological Park. It's absolutely impossible for Eastland's toad to have lived 31 years in a cornerstone. Dr. G.K. Noble, curator of reptiles in the American Museum of Natural History at New York. It's absolutely impossible for an animal to live without oxygen for any length of time. So there you are. Did old Rip live 31 years sealed in that cornerstone in Texas? Or didn't he? Well, I'll leave it to you because apparently the scientists and the citizens of Eastland can't agree. Can you imagine that? Well, now let's see. Oh, yes, here's an odd little story that I found in a newspaper of 1912. It was on May Day of that year in the town of Dothan, Alabama, that a group of workmen had uh, just finished lunch and were returning to their task of boring a well. All right, boys, get to work. Yeah, What's that? This sound popping much like a picnic. Lozy. Looky down there in that well. Uh, uh. Man, oh man, it's a white baby. Come on, come on, let's get to work. What's holding up the parade? Looky, boss, down there in that there old well. Little white child done fall in. What? Well, for, but don't stand there, get him out. We can't go down there in that hole, boss. It's 30 feet down to the bottom, and only 15 inches across. Well, none of us can get down there, no how. Yeah, you're right. We can't widen the hole or the dirt will fall down there on the baby. Yeah. Oh. What's happened? Oh, oh, run along, young run along, run away. Come on, tell me, what's that? Hey, there's a baby down that well. That's right, white boy. Baby done fall down there and we can't get him out. Of course you can't. You're too big. But I can. What? Well, sure you can. Uh, will you do it, boy? Sure, I will. Come on, tie a rope around my feet and let me down that way. Yeah, sure, go on, get a rope down. And tie it around him. And... Well, sir, young Henry Matthews, a tailor's apprentice, 11 years old, was lowered slowly down into that 30-foot well. Down, down, down toward the little three-year-old Benny Grant he went. Twice he tried and failed. Twice he had to be drawn up without the baby. Then, on the third try, at last his voice rang up the narrow excavation. Hold it! Okay, I've got him. Pull us up! <laughs> And the two were drawn up to the surface, both safe and uninjured. When the baby's father, bank cashier B.J. Grant, warmly thanked Henry Matthews, Henry said bashfully, Ah, uh, twa'n't nothing. Uh -huh, but the Carnegie Foundation and Mr. Grant thought differently, for Henry received not only a Carnegie Medal for Valor, but a trust fund to provide him with a college education. Can you imagine that? You know, a great many of our popular songs have had a strange, inspirational origin. Most of the so-called pop tunes today are written to fit a particular situation in a motion picture or a stage musical production. But some of the old ones can boast of a much more romantic beginning. For instance, well, let's go back to a home in Louisville, Kentucky in the year 1875. Thomas Paine Westendorf, a native Virginian, is sitting in the parlor with his beloved wife, reading. Tom. Yes, honey? Tom, I've been thinking... You know, the doctor says that since, since our baby died, he thinks I should have a change of surroundings. Yes, Kathleen, I know. And I think you should go back to New York in the spring to visit your mother for a while. Would you like that? Uh, you know I would, but 
Well, I, I so dread that long trip all alone. Alone? Oh, honey. You don't think I'd let you make that trip alone, do you? Don't worry. In the spring, I'll go with you, Kathleen. I'll take you home. Thank you, Tom. I, I think I'll go to bed. Good night. Good night, honey. After his wife had left the room, Tom Westendorf couldn't concentrate on his book. Something seemed to draw him to the piano. Music would prove a solace in the recent sorrow he and Kathleen had experienced. As he improvised on the ivory keys, his eyes fell upon an old song by George Parsley, Barney, I'll Take You Home Again. The words of the title struck him. Immediately, a melody seemed to drip from his fingers. Suddenly, he left the piano and began to write words. Verses flew across the paper before him. And within an hour, Thomas Paine Westendorf had written the words and music of one of our most beloved ballads. I'll take you home again, Kathleen, across the ocean wild and wide, to where your heart has ever been since first. Yes, Tom Westendorf really meant what he wrote when he penned the song, I'll Take You Home Again, Kathleen. Can you imagine that? Well, I'm afraid it's time to bid you all farewell again. This is Lindsay McCary reminding you that we'll be back again soon on this same station with another batch of amazing facts and fancies in the next session of Can You Imagine That?